to decide that the things that I tried were in my life just to get high on. When I sit alone, come get a little known, but I need more than myself this time. Step from the road to the sea to the sky. The uses and gratifications model was proposed to kind of test the notion of a passive media audience. Under this model, researchers, usually using in-depth interviews to supplement survey questionnaires, studied the ways in which people use the media to satisfy various emotional or intellectual needs. Instead of asking what effects do the media have on us, researchers asked why do we use the media? Asking the why question enabled media researchers to develop inventories cataloging how people employed the media to fulfill their needs. Conducting Media Effects Research Media research generally comes from the private or public sector, each type with distinguishing features. Private research, sometimes called proprietary research, is generally conducted for a business, a corporation, or even a political campaign. Public research, in contrast, usually takes place in academic and government settings. It involves information that is often more theoretical than applied. It tries to clarify, explain, or predict the effects of mass media rather than to address a consumer problem. This research employs the scientific method, a blueprint long used by scientists. First, you ask a question, then do background research, contract a hypothesis, test with an experiment, analyze your results, you figure out whether your hypothesis is true or not true, and then report results. Surveys. In the simplest terms, survey research is the collecting and measuring of data taken from a group of respondents using random sampling techniques that give each potential subject an equal chance to be included in the survey. This research method draws on much larger populations than those used in experimental studies. Surveys may be conducted through direct mail, personal interviews, telephone calls, email, and websites, enabling survey researchers to accumulate large amounts of information by surveying diverse cross-sections of people. These data help to examine demographic factors such as educational background, income level, race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, and political affiliations, along with questions directly related to the survey topic. Like experiments, surveys have several drawbacks. First, survey investigators cannot account for all the variables that might affect media use. Therefore, they cannot show cause-effect relationships. Survey research can, however, reveal correlations or associations between two variables, which is very useful. Content analysis is a systematic method of coding and measuring media content. Although content analysis was first used during World War II for radio, more recent studies have focused on television and film. Probably the most influential content analysis studies have been conducted by George Gerbner and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania. Since the late 1960s, they have coded and counted acts of violence on network television. Combined with surveys, these annual violence profiles have shown that the heavy watchers of television, ranging from children to retired Americans, tend to overestimate the amount of violence that exists in the actual world. Media Effects Theories by the 1960s, the first departments of mass communication began graduating PhD-level researchers schooled in experiment and survey research techniques, as well as content analysis. These researchers began documenting consistent patterns in mass communication and developing new theories. Four of the most influential contemporary theories that help explain media effects are social learning, agenda setting, the cultivation effect, and the spiral of science. Silence. Social Learning Theory The video scrolling on the screen documents the Bobo doll experiments conducted by Albert Bandura and his colleagues at Stanford University in the early 1960s. 72 children from the Stanford University Nursing School were divided into experimental and control groups. The aggressive condition, experimental group, subjects watched an adult in the room sit on, kick, and hit the Bobo doll with hands in a wooden mallet while saying such thing as sock him in the nose, throw him in the air, and pow! In later versions of the experiment, children watched film versions of the adult with the Bobo doll. Afterward, in a separate room filled with toys, the children in the aggressive condition group were more, more likely than the other children to imitate the adult's model behavior toward the Bobo doll.
Agenda setting. A key phenomenon posited by contemporary media effects researchers is agenda setting. The idea that when the mass media focus their attention on particular events or issues, they determine, that is, set the agenda for the major topics of discussion for individuals and society. Essentially, agenda setting researchers have argued that the mass media do not so much tell us what to think as what to think about. The cultivation effect. Another mass media phenomenon, the cultivation effect, suggests that heavy viewing of television leads individuals to perceive <laughs> the world in ways that are consistent with television portrayals. This area of media affects research has pushed researchers past the focus on how the media affects individual behavior and toward a focus on larger ideas about the impact on perception. The theory of the spiral of silence. The theory proposes that those who believe that their views on controversial issues are in the minority will keep their views to themselves, that is, become silent for fear of social isolation. As those in the minority voice their views less often, alternative and minority perspectives are diminished and even silenced. The theory is based on social psychology studies such as the classic conformity research studies of Solomon Ash in 1951. In Ash's study on the effects of group pressure, he demonstrated that the test subject is more likely to give clearly wrong answers to questions about line lengths if all other people in the room unanimously state an incorrect answer. The Ash experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example, if you The actors right have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is two. Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The Ash experiment has been repeated many times and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. According to the theory, the mass media can help create a false, overrated majority. That is, a true majority of people holding a certain position can grow silent when they sense an opposing majority in the media. One criticism of the theory is that some people may not fall into a spiral of silence because they don't monitor the media, where they mistakenly perceive that more people hold their position than really do. Cultural research focus on the investigation of daily experience especially on issues of race, gender, class, and sexuality, and on the unequal arrangements of power and status in contemporary society. Such research emphasizes how some social and cultural groups have been marginalized and ignored throughout history. Consequently, cultural studies have attempted to recover lost or silenced voices, particularly among African American, Native American, Asian and Asian American, Arabic, Latino, Appalachian, gay and lesbian, immigrant, and women's cultures. Textual analysis. Textual analysis highlights the close reading and interpretation of cultural messages, including those found in books, movies, and TV programs. It is the equivalent of measurement methods like experiments and surveys and content analysis. 
While media effects research approaches media messages with the tools of modern science, replicability, objectivity, and data textual analysis looks at rituals, narratives, and meaning. One type of textual analysis is framing research, which looks at recurring media story structures, particularly in news stories. Media sociologist Todd Gitlin defines media frames as persistent patterns of cognition, interpretation, and presentation of selection, emphasis, and exclusion by which symbol handlers routinely organize discourse, whether verbal or visual. Audience studies. Cultural studies research that focus on how people use and interpret cultural content is called audience studies, or reader response research. Audience studies differ from textual analysis because the subject being researched is the audience for the text, not the text itself. For example, in reading the romance, woman, patriarchy, and popular literature, Janice Radway studied a group of Midwestern women who were fans of romantic novels. Using her training in literary criticism and employing interviews and questionnaires, Radway investigated the meaning of romance novels to women. She argued that reading romance novels functioned as personal time for some women, whose complex family and work lives leave them very little time for themselves. Political Economy Studies a focus on the prediction of popular culture and the forces behind it is the topic of political economy studies, which specifically examine interconnections among economic interests, political powers, and how that power is used. Among the major concerns of political economy studies is the increasing conglomeration of media ownership. The increasing concentration of ownership means that the production of media content is being controlled by fewer and fewer organizations, investing those companies with more and more power. Political economy studies work best when combined with textual analysis and audience studies, which provide context for understanding the cultural content of a media product, its production process, and how the audience responds. The public sphere. The public sphere is defined as a space for critical public debate. It was first advanced by German philosopher Jürgen Habermas in 1962. He found that these societies had become increasingly influenced by free trade and the rise of the printing press. At that historical moment, an emerging middle class began to gather to discuss public life in coffee houses, meeting halls, and pubs, and to debate the ideas of novels and other publications in literary salons and clubs. In doing so, this group, which did not yet include women, peasants, the working class, and other minority groups, began to build a society beyond the control of arist aristocrats, royalty, and the religious elites. Public intellectuals who work on such shows as Meet the Press, as I do, um, cross the boundary between academics and the general public. In recent years, certain public intellectuals have also encouraged discussion about media production in a digital world. Stanford University law professor Lawrence Lessig has been a leading advocate of efforts to rewrite the nation's copyright laws to enable non-commercial amateur, amateur culture to flourish on the internet. He publishes his work both in print and online. American University's Pat Alderhyde, longtime media critic for the alternative magazine In These Times, worked with independent filmmakers to develop the documentary filmmaker's statement of best practices in fair use, which calls for documentary filmmakers to have reasonable access to copyrighted material for their work. Like public journalists, public intellectuals based on campuses help carry on the conversations of society and culture, actively circulating the most important new ideas of the day and serving as models for how to participate in public life. For Meet the Press, this is public intellectual, Kieran McGurl.